Welcome to the very best part of my broadcast week. Uh, this is Masters Week. For those of you who are familiar with the show, many, many of you are. We've never waded into this before. We've never done a Masters Week or golf-themed show around the Masters. We don't need to. CBS doesn't need my help, for goodness sake. The Masters doesn't need my help. Both stand well on their own in terms of broadcasting, talking about what is a huge convening event in American sports and in golf. But we're going to do a little bit of golf. We're going to do some other topics as well. My guest this week, Lisa Cornwell. She, for those of you who have watched the Golf Channel, you might remember her as a reporter, correspondent, and anchor at the Golf Channel. She was an outstanding junior golfer in this country, a contemporary of none other than Tiger Woods. They're still friends. So we're going to talk golf. We're going to talk the state of golf. We're also going to talk about workplace culture, the problems therein, her own struggles with that at the Golf Channel, which have gotten a lot of headlines, and some other topics about Lisa's life. Lisa, it's great to have you with us. Thanks for joining us. It's great to be here. Thanks, Major. What would you say, Lisa, is the state of golf in America? Let's start with the PGA, and then we'll also talk about the LPGA. That's a tough question it to is. answer right it's now. It's gotten really complicated the yeah. last three years for those I, of us who love the game and love to watch it. I think it's difficult, and I think that the um, the players are trying to navigate where it goes next and, and trying to make this something that's great for the fans um, to not make it about money. It's been about money a lot lately, um, and there are still a lot of question marks. So I think from a fan perspective, we're all, and in, I'm including myself as a fan and taking myself away from, from the work side, mm -hmm. um, we're still trying to figure it out, really. Recently, uh, this golf season, the Players' Championship was played, and at that event, many PGA players, Scotty Scheffler among them, said, look, mm -hmm. if golf fans are unhappy not seeing the world's best players, blame the players who left the PGA, went to play for Live." you agree with that sentiment generally? I do. Um, I will say when all of this first happened, I was a, a, a staunch, I was very a, a loud voice against what was going on, and I still am. I mean, as someone who has spent my lifetime defending women, advocating mm -hmm. for women, getting to know a Saudi woman in Lena al Hathlul, mm -hmm. whose sister, Lujain, was detained. Uh, for many, many years and, and knowing about these care home situation and, you know, people can talk geopolitically about Saudi Arabia all that they want. To know people personally who were and still are affected as a woman, I'll never be for Saudi Arabia coming in to the game of golf. And I, I, I still say on June 6, 2023, Saudis essentially tried to buy the game of golf. Now we're still waiting to see what will happen. But um, it's proof, Major, that whitewashing works, mm -hmm. and we're seeing it. Sports and it, washing, sports which, washing which is using across sports the board. to whitewash your right. complicated or and there's, indefensible human correct. rights record. And there's one thing to, to buy a soccer club or to buy a Formula One team. To try to buy a tour mm -hmm. and, and, and dismantle another tour... I mean, it's just been complete chaos and disruption. So, and yet those negotiations continue. Yeah. The head of the PGA, Jay Monahan, made it clear to the players that the negotiations are going on. He said he will take some time, but it doesn't sound like this is stopping. Well, and there's going to be a big uh, legal step to proceed too. I mean, the Senate Oversight Committee is looking into all of this. So right. there, this is not going to happen overnight. And. I have not had a discussion with Jay Monahan. I haven't had a discussion with anybody at the PGA Tour about this. This is not what they wanted. Mm -hmm. This is not. Their hands were forced to go in this direction because I think that the PGA Tour was really in a, a very delicate spot. Because big name marquee players were yeah. leaving, going for huge amounts of money, guaranteed money, lighter tour schedule, lighter competitive schedule, meaning fewer events, fewer holes, less grind. And bigger money. You work for CBS. What if the Saudis came in and started their own <laughs> network here in America and they started recruiting you and they started recruiting everybody from Fox and they started just spending un, un, foreseen amounts, amounts of, right. yeah, of cash and they could do whatever they wanted to. I mean, when you have pockets that deep, mm -hmm. you can't stop it. Well, let's talk about the LPGA. I was reading up on it. Um, I will say that uh, I know people who have... Uh, been to LPGA events. My daughter has worked as a volunteer at two very large LPGA events. They, she loved it. Yeah. The experience was amazing. I saw last year, 2023, largest purses awarded on the LPGA tour and the highest ratings yeah. ever. Is LPGA, not to be dopey about this, on the upswing? 
I think that the um, the fancy and popular answer is yes. Um, I, I look at it differently. Okay, please. And and I love look. I love the fact that they've that they've eclipsed the one hundred million dollar mark in total purses for a year. Those are happening at some very large events, though. The mm. the U.S. Women's Open, the KPMG, all the majors have really had this uptick in cash. They still have, by my last count, eleven events where the entire purse is less than two million dollars. <laughs> and I think at some point you have to start, you have to you have to say, look, our threshold is this because our players are worth this amount of money mm -hmm. and we're not going to accept anything below. You may have to stop start turning people away. But I do think that it's a great opportunity right now to really jump on the fact that fans are a little upset an with the PG there is. There's an, not just an opening, but there's an opportunity. And I don't really see them jumping on that as much. I mean, I think about what's happened in women's soccer. I think about what's happened women's in women's college, tennis, ba basketball, women's college women's basketball. Tennis. Um, they are very active in pursuing, you know, these large chunks of cash, these large broadcast windows. Women's golf still is not there. They've, as, uh, as Christine Brennan has always famously told me, they have for years accepted breadcrumbs where some of these other sports haven't. And the separation they need to get gap. more ambitious, in other words. 100%. 100%. Aim higher. Yes. Now's the time to strike. Absolutely. Now is the time to strike. There's never been a better time in women's golf to strike. And I'm not saying this because you're a women's golfer. I'm just saying it because I have this lived experience. When I watch the best men golfers, it's a kind of golf I can't really relate to. Because it's so great. Right. And I'm not saying women golfers are not also great, but I find their... They just hit something that a golf ball, a distance that I can r somewhat relate to. Right. Their game is more visible. You can't hit a 350? No, I cannot. <laughs> I cannot. <laughs> Me what, no matter No matter what kind of, on the moon maybe, <laughs> but only there. Um, I find watching that game cl closer, at least in my mind, mm. and an enjoyable experience, therefore. Do you think that's true? Did Absolutely. You? Um, you'll, you'll never hit it as straight as they do. No, so I, no, will I will say not. That. No, um, I will not. Or I can't fade it and I can't do right. all those other things. But it is a game that it's I find attainable. Attainable. Or, or at least theoretically sure. attainable. Right. I watch Scotty Scheffler. That's not theoretically attainable in any life I will ever live. No, unfortunately not. It isn't. No, it's not. It's. Um, it's true, and I wish. An opening and I wish. Too. That, yeah, I wish more people. And, and that goes back to the media coverage. I mean, when you think about what really blew up women's tennis, Billie Jean King was a huge part of it. But it was also opening the doors with these majors and mm -hmm. and having media there for every single women's major, right. and that brought in. You know, the journalist had no excuse to say, "Oh, we can't cover it." You know, we're too busy. They were already there, mm -hmm. so they had to stay and cover it. And it opened people's eyes, like someone like you back in that generation mm -hmm. who said, you know what, there's something to watching them play. I could really learn. Golf is the same thing. It just isn't being done on the media level. And I don't know how we do that. I mean, it's going to be very, very difficult to get the majors in all the same places. Mm -hmm. It'll never happen with the Masters. Right. It could happen with the USGA. They did the experiment at Pinehurst years ago. And it was a huge success. We need more of that. The RNA should look at that with the Open Championship for the men and the women. It would drive eyeballs to the women's game because of the media presence. That is the voice of Lisa Cornwell. I didn't mention it. We'll get to this. She has a book that she's written called Troublemaker. When I mentioned the idea about workplace and some friction, I guarantee you that's part of what the book's about and other things. We are at one of our favorite restaurants. You might recognize it if you're a longtime viewer. Risk lunch will be on its way. We're always appreciative of risks of making room for us whenever they can, which is frequently. More with Lisa Cornwell when we come back. Segment two of The Takeout coming your way in just one second. They don't want to lose their jobs. They don't want to lose their livelihood. They don't want to be branded a troublemaker. I just didn't care. Welcome back to The Takeout. Lunch has arrived here at RISS. Always thankful of that. Again, longtime viewers know chicken milanese. That's always my choice, and it's a really good choice. Lisa Cornwell is our guest. Lisa, you were talking about, as we went to break about the media and its approach to golf. You know a fair deal about that. What is the general media approach to golf? All men all the time? All men all the time. 
Yeah, women really get second Relegated. Fiddle. Yeah, they do, and it's unfortunate. Um, you know, I've been on on social media. I've been very active about this. The contracts that were signed, actually, I don't, I don't even think that the LPGA officially signed their television contract, from what I heard. Um, that's something, if I was the commissioner or advising the commissioner, that I would tell her to get in there and change immediately. And it's not just the, the coverage window, but look, golf is – Golf is a really good example of this. So people have this idea that women play very slowly. And what? And it's because of when they when they watch golf, because of the number of cameras. So if you go to a PGA tour event or you watch anything at a high level, cameras are everywhere. everywhere. So if I'm going if you and I are playing on tour, PGA tour, and, and I'm going through my pre shot routine and it takes me fifteen seconds, because all golfers at the professional level, for the most part, they're slower than when they just go out and play with their buddies. They're right. doing it for a living. It's right. understandable. In the men's game, when you have all these cameras, you can just go to shot after shot. They're limited with women, so they have to show a lot of time between shots and preparing for shots. So the viewer with gets a this. Camera, yeah, so it looks boring. Yeah, the viewer gets this longer. idea. Yeah, women are very slow. It's absolutely incorrect. The timing on on the two tours are about the same. Mm-hmm. And. Is it your belief, Lisa, that if given the opportunity, given the visibility, LPGA ratings would be not comparable, but better? 100% they would be better. Now, a lot of it, I think, is up to the, the responsibility of the players, too, when you get that opportunity to really showcase your personality. I mean, I will say men's golf has some great personalities. Mm-hmm. I mean, think about Jordan Spieth. Mm-hmm. Um, the audio and visual that we get to see and hear every week right. on PGA Tour Live is, is phenomenal. I think that the women could step that game up. That could definitely happen with awareness and, and more media presence. I mean, you know, the more that people are around it, they're used to it, the better they get at it. How did this mentality, all men, all the time, influence the culture within Golf Channel? I'm sure it was everything. I mean, the culture, as the Washington Post uncovered when Ben Strauss did his investigative reporting after I spoke out, I mean, this was this was the culture at Golf Channel from the beginning. Um, it certainly wasn't the culture that Arnold Palmer wanted to establish. He had no idea. But back then, even, you know, sports networks weren't as progressive as they are now. For golf, some reason we've always sort of been a little bit farther behind mm-hmm. and, and that maintains and it still exists today farther behind in terms of equality um, equality diversity correct and emphasizing correct a collaborative workplace and, and the like yeah i mean everybody talks about it you watch videos you maintain you know these these rules and regulations but if you have people in charge who don't adhere to that it's not going to happen. I mean, your culture is only as good as the people who are running the ship. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's in any place. Mm-hmm. And how much do you want to get into your experience at the Golf Channel? As much as you want. Okay. I know you don't want to leave golf, though. I could. <laughs> right, I know. <laughs> you but, love, but you in, love the in, sport. In, in, I love in it. In general, if you were to list your, your top grievances, and these have been and are being adjudicated, what would they be? In terms of what I went through at Golf yes. Channel? Um, oh, that's a great question. Uh I mean, number one, it's just it's just the treatment. I mean, I wrote a lot in the book mm-hmm. about this boys club that really existed, and it it's true. It was there from the from the get go of the network, and not much had changed since then. And there was this, a small group of people who who had been there for a long time and had a lot of power, even if they weren't at the top of, on the management chain. Their influence with everybody else because of just their longevity at the network. Um, yielded great power to those folks and I think that they did a a lot of damage over the years would you describe it as a toxic workplace it was when I was there yeah I mean look there were a lot of great parts about it there were a lot of great people um, but in those moments when the true colors would come out absolutely yeah there was a lot of toxicity were you harassed um I will say no, because I fought back. Like, I never allowed anybody to talk down to me. And that was part of the problem. They weren't used to somebody like me talking back. Hence the name Troublemaker. Correct. And that's, that's I mean, the, the title of the book is kind of tongue-in-cheek, because I would stand up 
for myself. I would stand up for other people. And then be labeled. And then be labeled, you're such a troublemaker. And people would laugh and joke about it. And I would laugh along with them and then continue to stand up when things would happen. I mean, there were some horrible instances, Major, before I even started dealing with it. I mean, I, I write in the book about a young woman who I worked with who was literally berated and cussed out. I heard the voicemail by a very senior level on-air personality who told her that, quote, any trained monkey could do her job. She was in her 20s. Mm -hmm. I I wanted, I mean, I wanted to slash his throat. Probably shouldn't say that on a podcast, (laughs) but, um, you know. Didn't happen, folks, but. That didn't happen, but that was the truth. I mean, around in Lisa Cornwell's brain for a moment or two. He didn't, he didn't get punished. Mm -hmm. He wasn't, he did. No repercussions. He did the show that night. Mm -hmm. She was this close to calling a lawyer Mm -hmm. and. They weren't even going to make him apologize and until you, they finally did when HR got involved. And you write in the book about when you began to uh, make public statements, many women at the network convened a kind of powwow, a group, yeah. and propounded an eventual letter. But even that, even in that solidarity moment, they had they struggled with repercussions to them and fears about retaliation and the like. They still worry about it. I mean, I cannot tell you how many people have reached out to me, mostly women. There have been some men of these true fears of re- of retaliation. And look, I'm living proof that retaliation still exists in this world. I mean, look at look at what happened. I went to Comcast or to NBC compliance and 6 months later, after 7 years of great job reviews and moving up the ladder. Once that happened, I got demoted. I was moved to a part-time role, and then a year later, I was pushed out. This brings up an interesting point that I want people to pay very close attention to. Because I read this in the book, and I've heard other women say this. HR is not your friend. Oh. And if you have an issue, you better have outside advice, and you better have outside legal eyes on it from the jump. And you better have documentation. I mean, that's one thing that as much as you can document, as much as you can And explain the part where HR is not your friend. They're not. I mean, they're, who signs their check? I mean, that's the simple part of it. I mean, a lot of times they're, they're trying to resolve a situation, but bottom line, they're trying to protect their own jobs. So, I mean, I've never really had anybody come to me and say, HR really solved this. They took care of the issue. Um, their They're jobs, not, their jobs from at your stake experience, too. an employee's advocate. I've never experienced. Their management's advocate. 100%. Again, who signs the checks? And that's a cautionary tale to anyone who finds themselves in this circumstance, male or female. 100%. Well, about any grievance. 100%. You have to be, look, you have to tread lightly. I mean, that's why I, I tell but people. But also be tenacious. Well, yeah, that's a, that's a different <laughs> subject matter. I mean, I, I, I've never operated in the in this sort of mindset or the frame of mind of worrying about the outcome. It's just instinctual in me to take care of whatever's happening. I get why people are scared of it though. I get why people don't. Mm -hmm. They don't want to lose their jobs. They don't want to lose their livelihood. They don't want to be branded a troublemaker. I just didn't care. Right. And if you're branded a troublemaker by one network, maybe you're unhirable for the foreseeable future. I'm surprised. You not only lose your job, but you may become quote radioactive or something. Nobody's touched me. I mean, I wouldn't even apply for it. I don't want any part of it. I mean, I'm glad that the PGA Tour and PGA Tour Entertainments brought me on to do their play-by-play broadcast. But to be honest, I was, I was shocked that they did. I didn't think anybody would touch me. I mean, your network would never touch me. ESPN would never touch me because these issues exist everywhere, inside and outside of the media. And it's really dangerous to have somebody who might be a threat to disrupting whatever's going on. A threat to disrupt whatever's going on. I think that's a pretty fair <laughs> description of Lisa Cornwell, our special guest. The book, again, Troublemaker. Our, we will continue our conversation over lunch about golf and many other things when we come back. Segment three of The Takeout in just one second. And I couldn't control my own happiness, but I could control the eating disorder. Welcome back. Lisa Cornwell is our special guest. Troublemaker is her book. We're talking about golf, but also life. And let's get into some life issues. Okay. Uh, Lisa, you write um, movingly to my eyes about a couple of um, issues in your life. One of them, an eating disorder. 
and I'd like you to share that with my audience because it was very profound for me to read. Well, thanks for saying that. Um, it's, it's probably the most important part of the book. And, and I say that, I don't think initially when I started writing the book that it became, or that it set out to be the most important part of the book. It was just sort of a, a side note that I wanted to let the readers know a little bit more about me. But the more that I wrote and revisited what happened back then, and I was in my <clears throat> late teens, early, mid 20s, I was bulimic. And as an athlete, you know, growing up and, and being super into fitness and physical health and, you know, everything's about how you look, especially as a woman. It just sort of transformed when I was going through a lot of my burnout issues and sort of closeted depression. Um, it somehow transformed into an eating disorder. And, and I had it for a number of years. I hit it from everybody. Um, if somebody said, what's one of your great skills in life? I would say probably back when I was bulimic and I hit it from everybody. I mean, it, it was a real real skill that I had but and I, I talk talk to mothers daughters fathers sons who might be listening to this about <clears throat> that journey and what you've learned looking back well that might be instructive or helpful to them in their ears that secrecy is is what keeps it going mm -hmm. and it was the secrecy and my ability to keep it hidden that that gave it the heartbeat and kept it going and Man, those years of therapy were really difficult because I'm such a private person. And so to, to go through and admit that I have these as, you know, I used to see them flaws. I wouldn't change my eating disorder for anything because it, it really did make me who I am today. I mean, I'm more comfortable accepting the fact that, that I have issues in my life, that I'm not perfect. You know, I mean, I always said if, if I write another book, it would be perfection is overrated. And it is, you know, just those growing up as a successful athlete, trying to be perfect, trying to win, trying to, you know, get those pats on the back. It's just a facade. And so the reality really came in when I started to do the deep dive. But to answer your question, I would say talk about it. If it's just a friend, if it's your dog, if it's your cat, whatever, just letting go of the secrecy is the path to getting better. And I read that for you, and I think this is true for many boys or girls who find themselves in this circumstance, much of their life feels out of control, but this idea of what you eat and how you eat and how you purge it is entirely in your control, which is part of the allure. 100%. It was the only thing in my life that I could control at the time. Like I told you, I was having this this bout, these issues with depression because, you know, I was this highly acclaimed junior golfer and I had lost my love for the game. And so I was searching, I felt alone, I was desperate and I did not know what to do next. I was jumping from school to school, trying to find answers that just weren't there. And I couldn't control my own happiness, but I could control the eating disorder. And there was something about that. There was right after what happened, this, you know, you would get this high from it because of that control mechanism that would kick in and it's no way to live. Also, I want you to relate that you were a very, explain to my audience how accomplished a junior golfer you were because it's really worth noting. You're amazing. Well, if you saw me play now, you would say, okay, <laughs> how much are we playing for? <laughs> but, yeah, I mean, I won my first. Back in the day. I won my first, yeah, way back in the day, unfortunately. Won my first women's, Arkansas women's state title when I was 14, which is still a record man or woman in the state. Um, went on to win four in the next several years. I was an All-American AJGA. I think when I was 16, I was the second-ranked junior player in the country. Yeah. And, you know, everybody thought. And that's thought, how you got to meet Tiger. Yeah, yeah, we grew up. We were, uh, we played a lot of golf together and, um became very good friends. I learned a lot from Tiger. And um, yeah, so I thought that I, he would go down the men's path, I would go down the women's path. Obviously that didn't happen. And so help my audience bridge a gap, because I think many would say, as I do to myself, oh my gosh, if anything, if I could have ever been that accomplished at that age, how could I possibly get burned out? Tell them how, how it can happen, because it did. It's life, life. I mean, life. It, it, I don't think that it was the golf. I think that, you know, I became sort of addicted, which is the only word that's popping to mind to my fitness that was going on at the time. That's right. when that first started. 
started playing less which golf. Which was related to your disorder. Which ended, right. yeah, which, so which fed, which fed together, yeah, they right. merged together. And when those two things merged, I don't know if it was necessary. I've always, I always called it a burnout, mm -hmm. but I think that it was more of these other things coming into my life that just pushed me away from golf because it put me in the spotlight and I didn't want to be there anymore because right. I just wanted to be, you know, in a dark room with my little eating disorder because that became comfortable. Right. It became and the, controllable. It was exactly. It became the the thing in my life that I could control. Do you love golf and again now? I do. You do. Maybe not quite as much as you do. <laughs> <laughs> well, but but so, I'm getting so there. So my love for the game is completely out of I'm getting ratio there. with my ability to play the yeah, game. Right. So well, I, it's, it's just it's, a mad chase for me. It's every part of my life. I mean, I'm married to an LPGA player. Mm -hmm. I work for Who the PGA that? Tour. Sarah Kemp. Okay. Um, it, my whole life is golf, so it's great that I can come up here in, you know, Washington, D.C. and escape a little bit of golf, but then, you know, we still, we talk about golf. But no, I, I do, I love it. I have this deep love and appreciation. It's given me everything. I would not be sitting here talking to you, mm -hmm. Major Garrett, mm -hmm. if golf was not part of my life. So, yes, I, I love it. I respect it. I'm thankful for it. I'm also deeply, there's a deep gratitude for it as well. Is golf in America as diverse as it needs to be? No, it's too expensive. I mean, bottom line, you know, you can you can be a poor kid in the worst neighborhood in in D.C. and go play pickup games in basketball. It doesn't right. matter. Or soccer. Or soccer or any sport, really. Um, it takes a little bit of effort, but you can even play baseball. A little bit more effort to play football, but golf is really tough. It is. And it, it just, it, it weeds a lot of people out, unfortunately. And we have to figure out a way to change that. I mean, think about the number of high-priced golf courses in your city alone. Mm-hmm. Very high priced. Yeah. Too and pricey for me, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. Oh, I bet they're throwing memberships at you like crazy. <laughs> no, they're not. No, they're not. No, they're not. Because they're full up. Yeah. Because the demand curve is still higher Correct. than supply. And that happened during COVID. I mean, the whole trajectory oh, yeah. changed. Yeah. And yes, and, and just to put a pin in it, uh, I play a very socially distant game of golf. So it really works for me. <laughs> I'm over there and I'm over there, you know. I should have brought my clubs. We could have done this on the golf course. Why? I'm surprised you didn't think about that. We'll have um, part two there our, next time. <laughs> is, is the LPGA Tour. I think the LPGA Tour is more diverse than the PGA Tour. Is that wrong? That's a great question. I would say it's more of a world tour. More of a world tour. Yeah, and that's probably just because of financial. Mm -hmm. um, the, the Ladies European Tour doesn't offer the prize money, although it does now that Saudi's involved somewhat. Um, but yeah, it, the LPGA Tour is definitely more of a global tour. There are more opportunities for men to play in Japan, Australia, Canada. Um, there are a lot of these singular tours that sort of feed those parts of the world where the women don't have that as much, at least not where they can survive financially. Mm -hmm. Right. Briefly, uh, how hard is it to be on any tour as a professional golfer? I wouldn't do it. I mean, that's another reason I'm glad that I had that eating disorder. It came into my, it saved me from the agony of playing professional golf. Like I've seen it firsthand. I've seen what, what Sarah did. I mean, you know, she, she got her card back and then would lose it and go to, back to the Ladies European Tour. Um, when she got her card back most recently, back in 2018, um, before she signed on and got her main sponsor that she has now, CME Group, uh, Terry Duffy, when he, when he brought her on board, she had $2,000 two in the bank. Like, she was literally about to go broke. I didn't know about it. Mm -hmm. I just met her. And, um, I mean, I just see what they do. Even, even for her now, who, who's doing well and, mm -hmm. you know, succeeding on tour and making more money, it's still hard. I mean, she got back from Singapore a couple of weeks ago and she's still recovering. You're lugging your equipment all right. over the place. Now she's not back in 32D, but right. it's still, right. I mean, it's still a very difficult way to live. Not all the glamour that you might imagine on the tour, <laughs> LPGA or PGA. Troublemaker is the name of the book. Lisa Cornwell is the author. Back for segment four in just one second. Courage isn't the absence of fear. Cour courage is being filled with fear and then doing it anyway. Welcome back to The Takeout. Our thanks again to Riss Restaurant. Our lunch, as always, delicious. 
Troublemaker is the name of the book. Lisa Cornwell is the author. Uh, you mentioned uh, talking about your wife, Sarah, and the tour card. Uh, for those who don't know, what's a tour card? How hard is it to get and maintain? And why is it so important to the life of a professional golfer, male or female? It's everything. So if you want to play on your specific tour, we'll go with LPGA Tour. Um, you have to, be, there's a certain priority order in which you get accepted. If you have your full tour card, um, you're in anything except for the majors. Those you still have to qualify. Certain events in Asia, you still have to qualify. But it's just simple math. The more tournaments you play in, the better opportunity you'll have to keep your card for the next year. So unless you're one of those players at the top, I mean, you're constantly just chasing job security. And Sarah's been in that position a lot. I mean, she was fortunate this past season where she was really just chasing to get into the Tour Championship. She secured her card pretty early. But, I mean, look, it's early in the, in the year here. We're not even at the halfway point. And I'm sure I don't ask her about it, but I guarantee you it's, it's on her mind. It would be like if your contract renewed every year. Right, yeah, or, or, every, or a matter of weeks or Correct. something. Correct, right. correct. So I want to talk to you in general mm. about uh, sports psychology. Um, I remember an interview that Tim Kirkchen, a legendary sports writer, story conveyed about one of the best baseball hitters of his generation, Dante Bichette, basically a career 300 hitter, top of the hitting prowess of that mm -hmm. era that he played Major League Baseball. And Dante Bichette told Tim Kirkchen that he lived in perpetual fear of never getting another base hit again. Mm. That even as good as he was, he was always fearful that it would slip through his fingers and never be recoverable. Is that something you as a, an accomplished athlete or your wife can relate to? I love the fact that you just use fear <clears throat> because it's one of my favorite words. And I think that it's so often misused. And, and I'll tell you why, mm -hmm. because the analogy and the, the story that you just told, I, it's always there. Um, some people have it more than others. It's where nerves come from, you know, this fear of failure that we have. I mean, you know, I write in the book about when I first started on TV about having sure, anxiety. anxiety. Yeah. Well, anxiety is just the result of fear. Fear leads to these incredible moments. I mean, you think of, you know, the great Mark Twain quote. I mean, fear, courage isn't the absence of fear. Cour courage is being filled with fear and then doing it anyway. Mm -hmm. And so I think when you go out there and you, and you have these emotions running through you that like I know that Sarah's felt on, on many occasions, Tiger Woods has felt it on many occasions. We could go through sports out athletes, the greats throughout history, they feel that, they just do it anyway. Mm -hmm. So you get better at accepting it, I think, and, and becoming friends with it. That's what I always encourage people to do. I'm not a sports psychologist, but the more that you can, can make friends with your fear or anxiety, the more that you accept it and you just say, you know what, let's go. Now we're going to be a duo out there and we're going to accomplish some big things. In your television career, did you learn to do that? No, <laughs> I wish I would have, but it, but it goes back to the secrecy. I mean, that was, again, it was something, it was different from the eating disorder, but I was really embarrassed about it and I was ashamed of it. And so I didn't want to tell anybody if I had told somebody about it, it would have, I mean, not that it would have gone away, but it, it would have lessened mm -hmm. itself significantly almost immediately. But I didn't want to admit that. You know, again, it's this, this desire to be perfect. That's why I'm glad that people in sports are talking about this more now, mm -hmm. you know, mental health and, and different things that they experience out on, on the course of the playing field. Right. To, to have coping mechanisms to say, you know what, we all have that. It's just not letting it stop you. You just do it anyway. I'm going to mention some names, um, and I'd like to get your associated take on them. Tiger. Mm. One word? Oh, no. No. Oh. Whatever you want to say. Oh, I love Tiger. I mean, smart, great personality, very misunderstood. How, um, how is he misunderstood? Well, he's lived this whole life where he's been in, in the spotlight. Public view, yeah. yeah. And he's, done, he's tried to do everything he, he can to stay out of it. To, to an extent, as much as he can. And so I think that people see this very, you know, tough guy, and he is tough. I mean, his dad was a Green Beret, and mm -hmm. he still, you know, has a lot of those qualities in him. But um, I could call him, and he'd do anything. I mean, he's, he's very loyal. He's a good friend. Um, 
I mean, go, go back to sports psychology, he's probably the smartest interviewer, interview answerer, mm. in terms of getting yourself in the right headspace mm-hmm. that has ever existed. And it's part of his greatness. He never allows anyone to take him down a road that he doesn't want to go. Like if, I, if you were Tiger and I said, mm, looked like a rough day putting today, how would, how would you describe it? He would say, no, I, I, I putted great. I mean, may not have gotten the results that I wanted, but my, my speed was, you know, right. even on the putts that I missed, it was just a little mystery. He would, he would totally redirect it in a positive way. He never lets his head go toward the negative. And so from a professional standpoint, that to me is what's always stood out. Rory McIlroy. Oh, probably needs to have, he's too nice. He's too nice. He's too nice. He's too nice. Yeah. Not, not from the standpoint of fans. I mean, right. Rory is great with fans, but I think when it comes to hardcore competition mm. and having sort of that chest out and, 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 and I'm going to battle mm-hmm. that. Which Tiger that's, most certainly had. Yeah. Well, if you look at. You Tiger look at, in his prime induced fear in his competitors. Correct. And Rory did that initially. In he fact, box, when, he so won, when he won the Open Championship many years ago and he was faltering toward the end, his caddy, who is in his caddy now, said to him, what are you doing? He said, you're Rory effing McElroy. Go play like it. And he said all of a sudden like that, I mean, it was a different Rory and he ended up winning. He needs some of that. He uh-huh. needs that reminder of how good he is because I think sometimes out there he forgets it. Best woman player on the tour. Hmm. Or two of the three of the top. Because if you say one, Boy, then, then there'll be... There'll be t- yeah, that is, such a, that is such a difficult question. The women's game has fluctuated so much. I mean, a lot of people would say Nellie Korda. Mm-hmm. Um, that's a tough one to answer. I mean, I guess that I'll, I'll go chalk and, and say Nellie, but mm-hmm. there's so much talent out there. Um, I still say if my life was on the line and there were certain shots that I needed to have hit for me, I'd pick Lydia Ko. You would? Yeah. Okay. How about Lexi? Lexi's a ball striker. Mm-hmm. Lexi's, Lexi's a ball striker. Um, I think that some of Lexi's fears have gotten in, in her way a little bit over the years. It's of no fault of her own. I mean, it's just a game that will get in your head. And, I mean, she's one of the most talented players I've ever seen, for sure. Definitely, probably the best female ball striker I've ever seen in person. As Sir Nick Faldo once said of golf, the longest distance in golf is between your ears. (laughs) Well, Nick had it right. (laughs) Lisa Cornwell, it's been a pleasure. Stay tuned for your takeout outtake especial. We'll see you next week, folks. Explain to my audience who your famous cousin is. Well, um... You know him well. I do. Yeah, 42nd president. (laughs) Welcome to your takeout outtake especial. Lisa Cornwell is our special guest. It's Masters Week. We've been talking about golf, but other topics as well. This is a widely accessible conversation, as I'm sure you've enjoyed. Uh, Lisa, uh, explain to my audience who your famous cousin is. Well, um, you know him well. I do. Yeah, the 42nd president, Bill Clinton. William Jefferson Clinton, in case you were curious about that. Yes. Have you played golf with him? Oh, gosh. Many times. <laughs> yeah, hundreds, How good a golfer hundreds is, how of good times. A golfer is the former president? He used to be good. I mean, he. we would have... Very uh, nice, heated matches. Played a lot at Army-Navy here. Played okay. some at Congressional, um, some at Andrews. So, yeah, I would visit D.C. a lot, and we would play golf. Played a lot in Little Rock. He used to be able to hit a long way. I'm trying to get him to work out. He was working out, started that during COVID, and mm. stopped it when he got back on the road and started traveling. Right. We played golf last fall, and I told him he needed to hit the gym. So I, I don't know if I motivated him or not. I'll have to, I'll have to check in. You know, Bill... Uh, he, he gets, he, he listens for a minute and then he forgets it and then he'll listen to somebody else. So I just have to keep reminding him. That very much, I believe, mm-hmm. Lisa Cornwell, <laughs> having covered the president uh, from various perspectives, Capitol Hill and the White House. Um, we have three questions we ask every guest on our program, Lisa. So I'm going to ask them to you. Take them in whichever order you prefer. Most influential book in your life and why? All-time favorite movie 
And if you're on a long flight or a long drive, like you're flying back to Arkansas, and you're going to really enjoy some music, what mm. artist or genre is that oh. most likely to be? These are great, great questions. The book is easy. Um, Nelson Mandela's Long Walk to Freedom. A lot of people probably don't know this. You may. <clears throat> um, Nelson Mandela's African birth name translates to troublemaker. Mm-hmm. And... I found that out three days after I turned in my manuscript and I was listening to his, to his autobiography or his memoir. Um, and that was right in in the beginning and it's just an incredible journey. Yes, I know. I wish in the manuscript, you discover that. I wish I had known it before I would have included it, but, um, that was inspirational to me, but his whole story, I mean, you're talking about somebody who just spent his whole lifetime fighting for freedom, Mm -hmm. no matter the cost. And, and that's what, and it's then did about. not hate his jailers on the other Most side. Most importantly, of it. yeah. In fact, that's a message that, that Bill gave me and I wrote about in the book that Mandela told him is, you know, if you walk away and you hate them, then you carry them with you. And he wanted to be free of that. So he forgave them and let go that of that. That hate fear. is its own metaphorical prison. 100%. 100%. Movie. Movie um, Shawshank Redemption. I mean, it's, it's a classic. classic. I mean, when the rock goes through the poster <laughs> and everybody's like, oh, my gosh, that did not happen. Mm-hmm. Incredible. Yeah. Um, Morgan Freeman is amazing. Tim Robbins mm. is amazing. Uh, it's a great buddy movie, not a buddy travel movie because they're all fixed in one place, but a great arc of story all the way through. And it has a great ending. Movies yeah. don't have great endings anymore. Why, why does that? I watch all these series and I leave it and it's this bad ending. I'm like, what? Can we just give me something yeah, go positive? Go back to the really boffo ending, ladies and yes. gentlemen. Yes. Um, music. Music. Boy, that's a great question. I'm all over the board, mm-hmm. Major. But if I had to pick one, um, I mean, I would probably go Lady Gaga. Very, very good. spirited. And I love her voice. I mean, classically trained vocalist mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. with just a ton of talent. So, and unconventional in her own way. Yes. Very unconventional Pat- and, and not afraid to hide it, right. um, but very thoughtful in, in the way that she performs. So, I mean, I love everything about her. That's great. Lisa Cornwell, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank, Thank you so you. much. My pleasure. We'll see you next week, folks.